All right, umbrella up. Sound blocker, the wind and the noise. There's an awful lot of noise in this traffic, but I'll be glad when I get a chance to go back into the park. Looking at Ephesians 2.17. <clears throat> and having come, he preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. Now, we go back. He had to backtrack. Every time you study, a, especially something like this with a long run on sentence, you have to go back and review. It's all important. Otherwise, you miss. So we go back to 13 and to 14. It stipulates that Christ Jesus is our peace. The word our referred to one, Gentiles who became believers in Christ Jesus, meaning those who were once far off, or far off. And two, author Paul and Jews who became believers in Christ Jesus, those who were near. <clears throat> in other words, all believers by the blood of Christ, Christ, that he himself is their peace who made both groups into one, breaking down the barrier of the dividing wall of enmity between them. The law brought enmity between the two groups. Now, we see Ephesians 2.15, after this, further establishes that the barrier of the dividing wall of enmity between Jew and Gentile, the law of Moses, was annulled in its entirety. Christ Jesus, having slain that enmity, making the two groups, of believers into one new man, thus establishing peace between them. Whereupon Ephesians 2.16 explains that this accomplished the reconciliation of both groups of believers, Jew and Gentile believers, into one body to God in Christ through the cross, having slain that enmity on the cross in himself, which is the sins of all mankind, paid for them, having fulfilled the purpose of the law, which was to reveal sin, not as a means of salvation, which man cannot do, but to give you the righteousness of God and that goal which is unattainable by man by their own efforts, and to demonstrate man's need of Christ, need of him, to believe in him for it, for salvation. Once Christ came, the purpose of the law was fulfilled in his flesh on the cross, and it was annulled in its entirety. Contrary to some who contend, well, we still keep the Levitical rules and not the ceremonial. Really? So now, Ephesians 2.17, which we're looking at, stipulates that Christ Jesus, having come, preached peace to Gentiles far away and to Jews near. Although Christ preached predominantly to Jews during his earthly ministry, accounts of his preaching to Gentiles are recorded in Scripture. We see many. Furthermore, Jesus did promise to give peace to his disciples. John 14.27 which relates to all men who have trusted in him for eternal life. As 2, 17, Ephesians 2.17 and Romans 5, one stipulate, and he did begin the Sermon on the Mount by saying, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Jesus' preaching implied receiving peace between God and mankind, and mankind one with another, through faith in his death on the cross for the sins of mankind. Note that in Ephesians 2, 12 to 13, rendered, remember that you Gentiles were at that time apart from Christ, having been alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and with God in the world, without God in the world, and now in Christ Jesus, you being once far off, became near by the blood of Christ, of the Christ. Verse 12 indicates that those who were far off, verse 13, and the Gentiles were alienated from Israel and God's covenants with her, having no hope and without God in the world. That's in, You can go back and review that. And in verse 13 it states that now that they have become believers in Christ Jesus, they, being once far off, or far off, became near by the blood of Christ. The words rendered far away or far off and near in Ephesians 2, 12 to 13 and 17 are thereby used in the Greek language and in the Hebrew in Isaiah 57, 19 to describe the position of Gentiles and Jews not only in geographic sense, but in a spiritual sense of being near Jews or far off Gentiles from God and from one another, those of both groups becoming near to God when they became believers in Christ Jesus. The original reference in Isaiah 
had to do with Jews and Gentiles and how they were geographically located relative to their distance from Jerusalem as well as their relative spiritual distances from God. Same thing, different time. Look at Isaiah 57, 1 to 2, and 19 to 21. The righteous perishes, and no man takes it to heart. Merciful are taken away, while no one considers that, that the righteous is taken away from evil. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. We jump to 19, 57, 19, creating the phrase, the praise, of the lips, peace, peace to him who is far and to him who is near. Say the Lord, says the Lord, and I will heal him. Jew and Gentile. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up refuse in mud. There is no peace, says, the, says my God, for the wicked. The phrase rendered peace to him in Isaiah 57 and 19 refers to the righteous man. The righteous man who is near and the one who is far off those who will receive eternal peace because they have been de declared by God as righteous, just like Abraham was, through faith. Other passages indicate that this declaration is as a result of a moment of faith alone and God's provision of eternal life through His Son alone. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. Now we move on to 18. 17 says, And having come, he preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. And then 18, For through him, through Christ, we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. <clears throat> so together, so they're together in many ways. So Christ Jesus, having come to earth in his perfect humanity, to reconcile sinful humanity to God in his flesh, through his sacrifice for the sins of all mankind, preached a message to all mankind of peace, eternal peace with God, and with one another for those who choose to believe in him for that reconciliation unto eternal life both Jew and Gentile <clears throat> and Ephesians 2 18 explains that Christ Jesus did all of this for both Jew and Gentile for all of humanity so that all who are in Christ Jesus in the sense of those Jews and Gentiles who have chosen to believe in him for eternal life <clears throat> would through Christ Jesus have access by one spirit to the Father Throughout this section of chapter 2, verses 11 to 18, author Paul has emphasized that Gentile and Jewish believers are of one group, one new humanity, one body. <clears throat> and through Christ Jesus, both have access to the Father by one Spirit, and there is only one Spirit of God. The emphasis on one makes emphatic that there is no longer to be any separation between Jew and Gentile for those who choose to become believers in Christ Jesus. Hence, the point of oneness is all the more emphasized in the phrase one spirit, not one spirit for the Jewish believers and no spirit or a lesser spirit of God for the Gentiles, the prevalent point of view of Jews and Gentiles, about Gentiles. you got to be making the Gentiles second-class citizens. In chapter 1, Paul wrote, Go away, go away, you're, you're too close. Street. But don't, you're too near me. You can pick it up later. Come on. In, one, in chapter 1, Paul wrote of the believer who being blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, which included being adopted into the family of God as sons through Christ to himself, as sons of, giving, as sons of God giving them access to God. So, moving on. A lot of interference here. Ephesians 1, 3-5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who did bless us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good will, to the good pleasure of his will. In Ephesians 1:2. It is stipulated that God is the Father of all the saints, the ones believing in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians 1.3, God is declared to be the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the word rendered our, twice implying that the saints, the ones believing in Christ Jesus, belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Since the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and since the saints are thus declared to have a familial connection 
with Jesus Christ, having been adopted as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, adopted as sons of God, Ephesians 1, 5, then they have a familial connection, connection with God as their father, as he is declared to be God our father, in Ephesians 1, 2. The emphasis of the saints being in the family of God, as children of God, belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ, is evidently an eternal relationship and a blessed one, holy by God's grace as a result of their moment of faith in his Son, in accordance with the spiritual blessings bestowed by God in the heavenly places in Christ upon the saints. <clears throat> That's a mouthful. The aorist nominative participle rendered, Who did bless? In the next phrase in Ephesians 1, 3, God, who did bless us in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, which literally means having blessed points to God's having blessed all believers in one time, in a one time completed action in the past, eternity past. He did it before we were even born. And all saints, those who have believed in Christ Jesus, including the Apostle Paul, are thereby blessed by God their Father with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm, every spiritual, spiritual enrichment needed for the spiritual life in the temporal life and for all eternity with God. <clears throat> Since these benefits have already been bestowed on believers, they should not ask for them, but rather appropriate them in their temporal lives by continuing in their faith, evidently through a study and obedience to God's word and constant acknowledgement of the shortcomings before God. We look at fellowship, the fellowship passage, so important. <clears throat> the sphere of God's spiritual enrichment is through being placed into Christ. As a result of being in Christ, of having believed in him for eternal life, these spiritual blessings have been made available to the saints, the one believing in Christ Jesus. So the place of these blessings is in the heavenly realm. Thus, these blessings are spiritual, not limited to the material, heavenly, but not limited to the earthly, eternal, not limited to the temporal life. Furthermore, access to the Father for believers in Christ includes their entrance into the heavenlies, as Paul wrote about earlier in chapter 2, two six, and raised us up with him, Christ, and seated us, seated us with him in the heavenly places, literally the heavenlies in heaven, an actual position in heaven established and guaranteed for us by Christ, in Christ Jesus. Even before we get there, even before this temporal life has ended, compare Ephesians 3.12, in whom Christ Jesus our Lord, we have the freedom and the access in confidence through the faith in Him. We move into Ephesians 2, 19-22 next time.